primary research topic for a number of years now has been Blake and the Beats, with some detours into Wordsworth and the Beats, and sometimes, quite often, just the Beats and the Beats, uh, although even in those articles, Blake usually gets some mention. I'm currently writing my first book, uh, as I just mentioned, which brings together many different aspects of Ginsburg's relationship with Blake. But for today's talk, I'll try to cast some new light on the Blake vision, already mentioned earlier in the conference by both Linda Friedman and Camilla Oliveira. And I'll start with just a few snippets of broader context for this. So I think especially for an audience outside of North America, it's important to start by emphasising Ginsburg's stature within 20th century American poetry, as well as his absolute centrality to the counterculture. So by the 1960s, he'd attained almost rock star levels of fame, quite remarkable for a poet. Uh, he also hung out with many rock stars, and he was particularly close friends with Bob Dylan from the early 60s, right up to Ginsburg's death in 1997. That is, of course, Ginsburg in the background of the Subterranean Homesick Blues video, which was filmed, incidentally, on pretty much the exact site where Blake's final residence at Fountain Court once stood. Uh, just behind what is now the Savoy Hotel. I haven't found any evidence that Ginsburg was aware of this, but like many of us here, Ginsburg really loved going on pilgrimages to sites associated with all the Romantic poets uh, whenever he was in the UK or Europe. So it is quite possible that he was conscious of this particular Blakean synchronicity when they were filming the video. More evidence of Ginsburg's immense popular influence is the well-known photo you see here of him wearing his Uncle Sam hat, which was actually a poster tacked up on student dorms across America. And Ginsburg's friend and biographer Barry Miles very aptly described him once as the central switchboard of the counterculture. Uh, Ginsburg's fame and sociability, combined with his experience of working in the advertising industry in the early 1950s, meant that he was perfectly placed to promote Blake within the counterculture, something he did almost obsessively. So when Dylan introduced Ginsburg to John Lennon in the Savoy Hotel around the time they shot this video, uh, Ginsburg's very first words to Lennon were, have you ever read William Blake? I also think it's not as widely appreciated as it could be just how scholarly Ginsburg's interest in Blake eventually became. So to take one example, in the late 1970s, he taught the complete works of Blake, line by line, at the Buddhist-inspired Naropa Institute that he'd co-founded in Colorado, which is now Naropa University. And it's also clear from his classes and journals that Ginsburg be eventually became quite familiar with a range of Blake's scholarship. And this rather charming notebook poem from 1978 includes Ginsburg's reminder to himself to read an article by David Erdman, which he says has been sitting on his bookshelf for a year. Actually, we might conclude that he was not too far behind with his reading, especially considering it had only been published the previous year. The slide shows just a few lines from what's actually quite a lengthy to-do list, um, but I also highlighted in the opening there um, the bit of an echo of Blake's London, I think, in that fourth line. So another route into Blake's scholarship for Ginsburg was his friendship with S. Foster Damon, who he met in the 1960s and who delighted Ginsburg by telling him that he had used peyote as early as the 1920s when he was writing William Blake, His Philosophy and Symbols. Um, there are actually some other interesting Blakean connections to the so-called Harvard peyote circle that S. Foster Damon was part of in the early 20th century, which perhaps I can talk about in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, so Ginsburg himself also had an, a piece published in the winter 1970-71 issue of Blake and Illustrated Quarterly. Um, this was not really an academic article as such, it was the extensive liner notes that he wrote for his 1970 Blake album, but it does once again show his interest in engaging with the academic Blake community. And I'd just like to briefly um, mention here this expanded version of Ginsburg's Blake album, which was released just a few years ago in 2017, uh, much expanded, uh, which is much closer to what Ginsburg originally intended to release back in 1970 um, or in the early 70s. Um, so I do highly recommend uh, listening to this, especially if you have a kind of vague 
memory of hearing some of Ginsburg's Blake settings and you're a little bit unsure about them, definitely listen to the to the new version uh, or the, the new old version, uh, which I think is is actually quite quite um, quite mind blowing. Um, so returning to the article that Ginsburg wrote to accompany his original 1970 album, it doesn't take long for him to mention the best known element of his relationship to Blake. In the second paragraph, he writes, inspiration began 21 years, half my life ago, living in Harlem. In mine's outer ear, I heard Blake's voice pronounce the sunflower, our sunflower, and the sick rose and the little girl lost and experienced an illumination of eternal consciousness, my own heart identical with the ancient heart of the universe. Ginsburg often said that his compulsion to retell this story was comparable to that of Coleridge's ancient mariner. The Blake vision really was foundational to his identity and career as a poet and activist. As Ginsburg makes clear in the passage on the screen here, the Blake vision did not happen in the psychedelic 60s or even the beat 50s, but way back in 1948, when Ginsburg was an unpublished 22 year old student at Columbia University. He frequently emphasized that the vision was not drug induced. And indeed, at this stage in Ginsburg's life, he had not yet encountered psychedelics. As I'll explain later, however, there was an important relationship between the Blake vision and Ginsburg's subsequent use of psychedelics. Although Ginsburg himself often used the singular term Blake vision, as a shorthand for his experience, this was actually a series of events over the course of around a week involving various states of non-ordinary consciousness, some of which were illuminating, as indicated by the classic visionary language in the passage here, um, but also some which were quite terrifying. And by calling this series of experiences his Blake vision and centering his accounts around the perception of having heard Blake's voice, which was really only one part of the experience, Ginsburg framed it as something fundamentally Blakean. So we are, of course, reminded uh, of the visionary encounter that Blake describes in Milton, a poem. And the third image here shows Ginsburg himself in 1979 in front of Blake's cottage in Felpham, holding up a copy of Blake's own picture of the cottage. Although Ginsburg talked frequently about his Blake vision, the narrative details that have been presented within scholarship on Blake's reception and even other writing on Ginsburg and the Beats have nearly always been drawn from a single source. The long interview conducted in 1965 for the Paris Review Literary Journal and published the following year. This reliance on one source has led critics to overlook other fascinating and sometimes conflicting accounts of the vision from both before and after 1965. So in the second half of my paper, I'll draw out some key elements of the Paris Review interview, but also compare and contrast these to other references to the Blake vision that Ginsburg made in poetry, prose and interviews. So just to summarize very briefly first, the sequence of events that Ginsburg describes in the Paris Review interview, he was at the time of the vision living alone over the summer of 1948 in a Harlem apartment that he was subletting from a theology student. He was feeling very lonely and also rather lovesick or heartbroken. And he was reading the books on religion and philosophy that were stacked all around him, belonging to this student. Um, significantly, of course, these books, and Ginsburg was very aware of this, these books contained lots of accounts of visionary experience. Um, one day, as he was reading some poems by Blake, he heard what he described as a very deep earth and grave voice in the room which he knew to be Blake's voice, but which also seemed like the voice of God. So he says in the Paris Review interview, uh, the apparitional voice in the room woke me deeper in my understanding of the poem. It was like God had a human voice with all the infinite tenderness and ancientcy and mortal gravity of a living creator speaking to his son. And he quotes from Ars Sunflower and says, and simultaneous to the voice, there was also an emotion risen in my soul in response to the voice and a sudden visual realization of the same awesome phenomena. That is to say, looking out the window, through the, uh, through the window at the sky, suddenly it seemed that I saw into the depths of the universe. These events continued same day with the voice reciting two further poems from Songs of Experience, The Sick Rose and Little Girl Lost, 
And over the next week or so, Ginsberg had other experiences which were more frightening. One day in the Columbia University bookshop, leafing again through Blake's poetry, he read the human abstract and had a profound and disturbing vision of the absurdity of life and the unhappiness of humanity, which then brought to his mind Blake's poem London with its mind forged manacles and marks of weakness, marks of woe. Most frightening for Ginsberg, however, were two further occasions that week when he actually attempted to deliberately conjure up the experience, later he made the obvious comparison to Faust, uh, the results were much more like a bad trip, um, characterised by quite extreme paranoia. Overall, then, these experiences range from ecstatic to terrifying, and many numinous states somewhere in between, such as he describes here in relation to the sick rose, where he talks about um, I experienced the sick rose with the voice of Blake reading it as something that applied to the whole universe, like hearing the doom of the whole universe, and at the same time, the inevitable beauty of doom. He also attempted to capture this feeling of, sort of dark sublimity uh, in several poems that he wrote in the immediate aftermath of the visions. And we should note that these kind of short lyric poems from the 1940s are entirely different to Ginsberg's later mature style, um, and they're only published much later, sort of as juvenilia, really. Um, this one on reading William Blake's, William Blake's The Sick Rose, so this seems to have been written really immediately after his, his week or so of visionary experience, and it goes like this. Rose of spirit, rose of light, flower whereof all will tell. Is this black vision of my sight the fashion of a prideful spell? mystic charm or magic bright a judgment of fire and of fright what everlasting force confounded in its being like some human spirit shrunken in a bounded immortality what blossom gathers us inward astounded is this the sickness that is doom he also attempted to capture Sorry, I've read that. Um, we should note that these, yeah, sorry. So the object of Ginsburg's heartbroken lovesickness was Neil Cassidy. And at the time of the visions, he wrote Cassidy a letter. Let's go back a bit. Uh, he wrote Cassidy a letter in which um, he simply states that the light broke for me several times in the past weeks. So no mention there of Blake. Ginsberg's earliest sustained narrative account of his Blake vision was composed around a year later in 1949, where, he appear, where it appears as an almost incidental element of an unpublished portrait that he wrote of the street hustler and beat muse Herbert Hunky, who moved in with Ginsberg shortly after his vision and stole the unfortunate theology student's books to feed his heroin habit. Interestingly, this account contains several descriptive phrases which recur almost word for word in the much later Paris Review interview, but also some notable factual differences as Ginsberg makes broad comparisons between his visionary experiences and the content of Blake's poetry, but actually omits any mention of hearing Blake's voice or the causative role of reading Blake's poetry, which of course feature so strongly in his later accounts. As Ginsberg makes clear in his 1965 interview, his perspective on the Blake vision changed considerably in the decades following the vision. We've seen how at the time of the vision, Ginsberg had a strongly theistic perspective, considering the voice he heard to be a sort of combination of Blake's voice and that of a distinctly paternal God figure. He also had a longing to capture the essence of his experience, to understand or even repeat it. So from the early 1950s onwards, he began using a wide range of psychedelics, including peyote buttons, synthesized mescaline, ayahuasca, psilocybin, and eventually LSD, as well as other drugs such as nitrous oxide and ether, in an attempt to reproduce what he described as his earlier natural psychedelic experience. Eventually, however, partly as a result of the Hindu and Buddhist teachings that Ginsberg received during an 18 month stay in India in the early 1960s, he began to see that his attachment to the Blake vision and relentless quest to understand it through reproducing it was unhealthy and, un and unnecessary. He therefore refers in the 1965 interview to abandoning Blake and also seems to infer that he will stop taking psychedelics. These statements have led to some confusion in scholarly accounts of this, um, but actually, a, a, and even the kind of simplistic claim that around this time, Ginsberg swapped Blake for Buddha, 
However, a careful reading of the interview alongside other contextual writing by Ginsburg shows that what he really meant was not abandoning Blake. If anything, his interest in Blake's poetry intensified, and as we've seen by the 1970s, had become almost scholarly. But rather, he meant letting go of attachment to the vision, and just as importantly, reconsidering his previous theistic understanding of it. So shortly after the public publication of the Paris Review interview in 1965, Ginsburg wrote a letter to the editor clarifying that he had not abandoned Blake or psychedelics and describing a recent LSD experience which had brought to mind the poetry of both Blake and Wordsworth. It seems to me that there were two aspects of Ginsburg's interpretation of his vision that became more significant for him from the mid 1960s onwards. The first of these was the idea that literature, and particularly the poetry of William Blake, might have a chemical effect on the brain, perhaps due to specific breathing patterns when reading it, which could perhaps trigger visionary experiences. Blake's poetry in this model was literally a psychoactive drug. The, uh, this idea was, in a way, a more materialist adaption of his earlier, more esoteric belief that Blake's poetry contained what he called a magic formula for vision. The second important shift in his presentation of the vision involved his efforts to transform his lonely experience of 1948 into a communal one. As he found himself at the heart of the counterculture of the 1960s, something which he and his beat friends had done much to bring into being, he started to claim that the real shift in cultural consciousness had begun not in the 1960s, but at the time of his Blake vision in the late 1940s. He wanted to claim, however, that this was not just a result of his individual vision, but rather involved something much more broadly experienced. So an example of this trope occurs during a 1971 class that Ginsburg taught jointly with his fellow poet Robert Duncan, who we heard about in Linda Friedman's keynote. Um, and he taught this class, uh, as I said, in 1971 at Kent State University, not, not long at all, actually, after the, the Kent State massacre, which is interesting. The class began with the two poets discussing their joint interest in Blake and Milton and concluded with Ginsburg articulating his thesis that the various interlinked schools of avant-garde poets, of which he and Duncan were representatives, were a community that came to total clear consciousness with accompanying explosions of mystical visions and epiphanies around 1948. The date in itself makes it obvious that he is thinking here of his own Blake vision, but it's typical of his desire for community that he wished to turn this retrospectively into a shared event among the new American poets and ultimately among society more broadly. And Duncan, at least on this occasion, seemed content to go along with Ginsburg's thesis. So I want to conclude by drawing out some features of the Blake vision as represented in Ginsburg's most famous poem, Howell, published in 1956, where he describes those who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes, hallucinating Arkansas and Blake-like tragedy among the scholars of war. Those who are being apostrophized here are, of course, the best minds of my generation or angel-headed hipsters from the poem's famous opening lines. And we can see that even at this relatively early stage in his poetic career, Ginsburg wants to turn his individual visionary encounter with Blake into a communal one. It's also interesting how the highly condensed description of the event as Blake light tragedy manages to combine classic visionary imagery of light, uh, which is reminiscent of his letter to Cassidy at the time of the vision, with the more with the less expected word tragedy a reference perhaps to the personal crisis he was going through in 1948 and to the heavier, darker elements of the vision. The word hallucinating is also interesting here. If we take the object of that verb to be both Arkansas and the Blake like the Blake light tragedy, then this seems to indicate a level of scepticism on the part of Ginsburg towards the reality of his vision. Although this is complicated by the suggestion that America itself represented metonymically here by the state of Arkansas, is a hallucination. The remainder of the line is, of course, a reference to the military academic industrial complex of the Cold War, the context within which his visions took place. And finally, this is my final slide, um, if we return to the quotation that I used in the title of this paper, which is from the Moloch section of Howell, 
He describes how they, the angel-headed hipsters, broke their backs, lifting Moloch to heaven, pavements, trees, radios, tons, lifting the city to heaven, which exists and is everywhere about us. Visions, omens, hallucinations, miracles, ecstasies gone down the American river. Dreams, adorations, illuminations, religions, the whole boatload of sensitive bullshit. So once again here, we have an insistence on communal visionary experience alongside a markedly Blakeian reference to heaven, which exists and, and is everywhere about us. But we also have the visionary mode being undercut and the sceptical reference to the whole boatload of sensitive bullshit. This is a tension that persists in Ginsburg's accounts of his Blake vision, just like the tension between Ginsburg's desire to fashion himself as a lone prophetic bard and his urge to celebrate and even create communal visionary experience. 